Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In the previous video, I took a look at Lawrence Bonjour's article in defense of the a priori, which comes from the book Contemporary Debates in Epistemology, second edition. In this video, I will look at Michael Devitt's There is no a priori. And this uh, article has been written specifically as a reply to Bonjour. Right? So it doesn't make much sense to read Devitt's article without reading Bonjour's article first. Or maybe to watch this video without watching the previous video first. All right, so Michael Devitt, there is no a priori. Again, the issue here is between those who believe that certain beliefs that we have uh, are justified a priori. That is, without the senses playing a role, but through something like pure rational insight into the necessary truth. So some of the things that I believe, or even know, some of the things that I know, Bonjour says, are justified through my rational insight into their necessary truth. And he's thinking about things like 2 plus 2 is 4, things like if A and A implies B, then B, and things like no object can be entirely red and entirely blue at the same time. Right? Those are supposed to be true, we are supposed to know them, and we are supposed to know them not on empirical grounds, but through pure rational insight alone. So Michael Devitt, when he says there is no a priori, is going to argue that uh, we don't need that kind of story. That's really it. He's not going to sort of try to prove that it's false. Um, his tactic is more like this. He's going to say, well, we already have uh, empirical justification or empirical knowledge. If we have to add a priori knowledge to that, okay, we will, but if we don't, if we don't have to add it, if it seems plausible that all types of knowledge can be understood as justified in an empirical way, then it's better to have a theory like that, right? It's better to have a unified theory rather than a theory that sort of breaks up into two parts, especially if one of those parts is particularly obscure. And so uh, David says, what I have to do in this article is really two things. I, on the first hand, I want to undermine the motivation for positing a priori knowledge by showing that this troublesome knowledge, right, troublesome for the empiricist or the naturalist, that this troublesome knowledge could be empirical after all. And second, I want to demonstrate the obscurity of the a priori, of this, this entire story that somebody like Bonjour is trying to tell. And so I make plausible that I can, as an empiricist, account for mathematical knowledge, logical knowledge, and so on. And I show that the person who posits a priori justification is definitely not better off because their account is obscure. Well, then that is a big win for empiricism here. Okay. So David's motivation is what he calls naturalism. And in this sense, naturalism is basically the idea that um, is the it's he calls it epistemological naturalism, and it's basically the idea that we get we get all our all our knowledge, all our information, anything that we know about the world through our senses, right? And so certain things that we seem to know about the world, such as that you know nothing is both blue and red all over, it has it has to come to us through the senses. Right, because it's knowledge about the world. Well, it has to come. I mean, that's the idea. That's what naturalism wants to show. And David thinks that naturalism is a very, you know, it would be a very nice position if we could defend it. And so he's going to try to do that. But of course, I mean, to defend it, you have to show that naturalism is able to account for our knowledge, at least as well as other accounts, such as accounts that bring in a priori insight. The way that David sort of um, explains naturalism depends heavily on Quine and his holistic picture of beliefs, uh, as well as on Neurath's metaphor, which is a little bit in the same direction. So Quine tells us in Two Dogmas of Empiricism that 
all our beliefs form part of an interconnected web that is tested only as a whole by experience. So experience may fit or may not fit our web of beliefs. And if it doesn't fit it, then we have to change something. And it's in a sense up to us what we change. There are often many, many choices. And so usually we leave in place the most central ideas that we have, such as the ideas of logic and mathematics, the kind of ideas that Bonjour calls a priori. But we leave them alone, mostly just because it would be so radical to change them. Uh, it would sort of require us to change so much in our web of belief that it's not very pragmatic to do so. But sometimes, if experience is recalcitrant enough, we might actually, Quine says, want to give up or change the laws of logic or change our mathematics or change something like that. Uh, so that's the, the Quinean metaphor. And Neurath's metaphor is that, um, well, basically, we are like people sitting in a boat and we can change any plank of that boat. And the planks are sort of the pieces of our knowledge. We're at sea in a boat and we can change any plank in our boat if we think that it's not really sort of doing very well anymore. Uh, as long as we don't try to change everything at once, right? We can't take the entire boat apart, then we would drown. But for any particular plank, we can take it out and replace it with a new one. And so that's supposed to be the, uh, uh, the truth about about a priori knowledge too, right? We can we can even like sort of change one of our mathematical or logical beliefs, um, as long as we sort of keep enough of our other beliefs stable. How does David now answer Bonjour? Well, here is I think his most uh, accurate uh, account of what Bonjour doesn't like about this Quinean story. And it's on page 187 in what uh, David calls objection three. And this is really where sort of the serious objections begin. So he has Bonjour basically say the following, on your Quinean alternative, experience justifies beliefs in the interior of the web via links with beliefs at the periphery, via links with beliefs close to experience. But these justifications depend on the links themselves being justified. The objection to your alternative is then this. The justification of these links has to be a priori. It could not come from experience. And now I'm skipping a bit. In brief, the objection is that logic must be seen as a priori because we need logic to get evidence for or against anything. So if I were with David, what I would like to say is this. I want to say, well, our laws of logic and our rules of mathematics are justified by experience. How? Well, I mean, it's true. I don't go into the world to check whether two plus two is four, but the rules that include two plus two is four, you know, they shape my web of experience. Uh, sorry, my web of beliefs. And that web as a whole fits experience very well. And therefore everything in the web is justified. So experience justifies everything in the web at once when it fits well. And so everything, including the laws of logic and the rules of mathematics are justified by experience because they are justified through the fact that they are parts of this interconnected web of beliefs, which fits experience. Okay, that's the story that Quine and David want to tell. And then Bonjour's argument against that is, well, the entire idea that experience sort of fits the web and that certain elements of the web fit together in a coherent way requires us to be able to link all these beliefs and experiences through logical rules. And so those logical rules at least have to be justified without the web, right? They have to be justified by themselves. They have to be justified a priori. Okay, how does, how does David respond to that? Well, he responds to it in, in, in several ways. And I think the most important response that he gives is this. He says, well, I want to make a distinction. It's a well-known distinction between premise circularity and rule circularity. So a premise circular argument is an argument that goes like this, right? I have got some premises, A, B, and C, for instance. 
and from those I conclude A. Well, that doesn't do a lot to justify my belief in A, because it was one of the premises. Right? It, it looks really bad when you try to justify a belief by invoking that very belief. But what about rule circularity? Well, rule circularity is different. It's where I justify a rule. I give an argument to justify a rule. And that rule, like the conclusion, is not one of the premises. But I use it in making the argument. Okay, so here's a famous example. Uh, suppose that I'm Hume and I have just given my skeptical case against induction. And now you say, well, no, I think we should be, we can be very justified in believing in induction uh, because I've used induction a lot of times and most of the times it works very well. Therefore, induction is going to work very well in other instances as well. So the claim that induction is going to work very well in general, which is my conclusion, is not one of my premises. Because my premises are, I have used induction uh, very often um, and it worked almost every time, right? I have used induction very often, it worked almost every time. Therefore, induction is going to work in general. What's strange about this is that I'm, I'm sort of giving an argument for the rule of induction, but the argument is itself inductive, right? The argument itself has the form, well, if you've experienced something a lot, then it's probably true in general which is the rule that I'm trying to justify. So how bad is rule circularity? Well, Bonjour is going to say in his reply to David, which is not part of this video, uh, that he thinks it's terrible. David here says that he thinks it's fine. Rule circularity, according to David, is fine. Um, he says, well, I argue with those people who say that rule circularity is not reprehensible. Uh, guided by the Neur Neurath image, we accept the non-epistemological part of our web for the moment and seek to justify the epistemological part T. And I, I, I must admit that I don't fully understand uh, David's argument here because he seems to be saying that um, what we can do if we want to justify, let's say, the logical rules is we, for the moment, accept all the other planks of the boat, like all the empirical knowledge that we have. And we say, well, that's really good empirical knowledge. And so we can be very happy with our web of beliefs. And so, well, that justifies the rules of logic that we've been using all this time. But that still seems to sort of use the rule, right? So I think it, it really comes down, David's argument here really seems to come down to the bare assertion that rule circularity is not problematic. And I'm, I'm not sure why you would think that. I'm not entirely sure why you would think that rule circularity is not a real trouble, a real problem. Okay, but that's that's important for for David. But then he, he sort of makes a second point. So even if you don't agree with him, the second point might sort of pull you into his camp. Because he says, well, rule circularity or not, um, Bonjour or anybody else who defends the a priori has the same problem. You have the same problem because whenever you justify something through a priori insight, you will have to use the rule that a priori insight is a good reason to believe something. Now, why do you believe that a priori insight is a good reason to believe something? Well, of course, you don't have empirical reasons for that, right? Um, you're supposed to have a priori reasons for that. But that means that you have this rule circular, um, this rule circularity happening here too. Because in order to justify your belief that a priori insights are a guide to truth, you have to assume that a priori insights are a guide to truth. Right? And so you have a circularity here too. Uh, again, I mean, um, Bonjour is going to reply to that. And well, again, I'm, I'm not really talking about Bonjour's reply, but I think it's nice to, to mention something about it. Um, especially because I think that Bonjour has a good rejoinder to this. He says, look, a priori insight doesn't use a rule, right? When I immediately see that two plus two is four, or when I immediately see that something can't be red and blue all over, I'm not making an argument that says, well, if I immediately see something, then it's probably true. I mean, immediately seeing 
that's that's already enough to give me this conviction and this rational conviction in fact might be a bit mysterious but it's i think definitely way the way that the a priorist has to go right i mean if you defend the a priori then those a priori insights shouldn't be sort of reasons that you fill into an argument and then you get your belief right i mean they should generate and justify the belief sort of immediately okay David goes on to uh, explain to us that the idea of a priori insight is very obscure, right? And basically his, his problem is that nobody has really told us what it is to have a rational insight into the necessary truth of something. Um, and, you know, he says, well, even if you sort of were to bring it down to sort of insight into logical truths, well, what justifies logical truths? No satisfactory non-empirical account has ever been given of how they can be justified. Without such an account, we have not described a non-empirical way of knowing. So here David is saying, I just need more, right? I want to hear more about what empir with this, this intuitive, immediate, rational insight is supposed to be and how it is supposed to give us knowledge about something. Okay. Um, if you don't tell me that, then I, I don't really see a theory here. Bontu is going to reply to that by saying, well, look, um, in the cases where you have this insight, the truth is just obvious. And yeah, it would be nice to have more of an account of, it, of, of this kind of a priori insight, which we don't really have. But, you know, when you have it, it's clear, right? You see why it's true. You understand why it's true. Um, we can we can rely on that even if we don't have an account okay i don't know how strong that is but it's certainly a, a one way to to try to uh, to respond to david so i want to talk about one more point that david makes i think it's in some ways the most interesting point and bonjour doesn't really respond to it as far as i uh, as far as i know here's what david says well, this a priori insight is supposed to give us insight into the world. But how is that possible? Right? How is it possible for a priori insight, which does not depend on an empirical relation to the world, to give us insight into that world? Well, here's how he describes it. And this is page 193. He says, what sort of link could there be between the mind brain, mind slash brain, and the external world, other than via experience, that would make states of the mind slash brain likely to be true about the world. What non-experiential link to reality could support insights into its necessary character? And this is, of course, a very good question, right? If somebody claims to have insights into the necessary character of the world, which don't depend on a causal empirical relation between me and the world, how is that possible, right? How is it possible to know something about the world, to know something even about the necessary structure of the world without having sort of been in contact with the world? How does that work? Well, I think if you, if you want to defend a priori knowledge, then you really want to answer David's question. And David's question might require a pretty radical answer. Right? It might require us to accept something like idealism, maybe. I don't know. Um, well, I mean, I'm a big fan of Kant's transcendental idealism. And so, of course, my impulse here is to say, well, Kant's transcendental idealism can give an answer to that. But of course, I mean, that's a very controversial metaphysical position. And if it turns out that defending a priori knowledge requires a very controversial metaphysical position, you might want to think two or three or four or five times about it before accepting a priori knowledge. On the other hand, if it turns out that empiricism without a priori knowledge can't really generate even empirical knowledge because we always require insight into the necessary a priori structure of reality, well, then this entire conundrum becomes a reason to accept something like transcendental idealism. And of course, that's the way that I'm thinking about it 
but it's not too likely maybe that it's the way that you're thinking about it um, because I know that for now I'm still in a uh, in a small minority here so I hope that that's um, that, that has been an interesting way to explore this dialectic between the empiricists and the rationalists between somebody like Bonjour and somebody like David I think these articles are, are admirable in their clarity there's a reply by Bonjour and a reply by David and a further reply by Bonjour in the book, this book, Contemporary Debates in Epistemology, second edition, uh, edited by Stoip, Turi and Souza. So if you want to explore it a little bit more, I would absolutely recommend to read all of it, including these, these short further replies. Um, thank you and see you in another video.